Tools of Type 3 for All podcast. This is your host, Pedro Abreu, and today I gather with two good friends of mine of grad school, Eric and Nitin, to talk about principles of programming languages, one of the major conferences in our field, Popol, Scala, Isabel, Parametricity, the Dependent Object Types, and much more. Disclaimer, please don't take any of our opinions as final truth. We are just some students discussing our ideas to the best of our knowledge. Always do your own research and form your own opinions. With that out of the way, let's get into this episode. Let's go. So this semester, I'm really, really happy and very proud that I get to be a TA for programming languages. The grad course, we're teaching COG, going over software foundations. Could I ask for a better life? No, I couldn't. I'm really happy. And I get the pleasure to have Nitin to be there with me and my own advisor, Benjamin Delaware. But Benjamin Delaware is not here. Nitin is. Welcome to the show, Nitin. Hi, it's good to be here. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Oh, all right. So uh, where to begin? I'm one of those people who believed at some point of time that he wanted to do a PhD, spent three years uh, running after it, and then decided, do I really want to? I mean, it's not like I know for sure I don't, but I also realized that I kind of need to get out there, experience the world and like figure stuff out. So, so I'll be taking, so I'm, I'm, I'm on the job market right now, but, uh, <laughs> but uh, we'll see where the, where life takes me. I mean, in a couple of years, I'll either be still working out there or maybe I'll be back here somewhere. So you, you joined Purdue, you were working with Suresh, right? What were you doing then? Uh, so there we were working on stuff related to um, the concept that version control should be for your data too. So we were working on this idea known as a mergeable replicated data type, uh, where essentially essentially you can merge two data types in the same way that you like merge things in version control. So uh, you define an explicit merge operation. Uh, it requires a few certain properties. Uh, I am not an expert on that stuff, though, because I didn't really work on that for very long before I moved on to things which I was more interested in, like uh, formal verification and like uh, proving properties of programming languages like dependent object types in Scala. And that's the stuff which I'm actually more excited to talk about. Like, oh, I'm really excited. We're definitely going to talk more about those things because this is going to be an episode talking about all the cool projects, a bunch of, well, not all, because I mean... That would take forever, but a bunch of cool projects in the realm of functional programming languages, of interactive theorem improvers, and whatnot. But anyways, another really cool guy that is here with me today is Eric Bond. Welcome to the show, Eric. People already know you, but present yourself again, because I know that you are in an even more exciting job now, or maybe... <laughs> I don't know. Tell us about, about yeah, it, situations man. change. Yeah, um, happy to be back. Thanks for having me back again. Um, so yeah, my name is Eric. I am a uh, also Pedro's former roommate. <laughs> but, uh, um, I'm a senior research scientist at Two Six Technologies. Um, probably haven't heard of that company before, and I definitely hadn't before I applied. But they're a medium-sized research company outside of DC that focus on cybersecurity. And I am a part of the applied math team, which primarily focuses on uh, software or formal verification for software and hardware. Um, hardware verification is not as fun. I'll just I'll just go on. <laughs> I'll go on record and say that 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 sucks. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. <laughs> I know the thing, like, but okay. So what tools are you using? Like give us some more details. Yeah. So for one of my programs, I'm on the DARPA's deep right program. We're using Isabel Hall, which this is my first encounter with the Isabel Hall theorem prover. And I, I will say I, I am, it is one of the first times where I felt like there's a theorem prover that's or a proof assistant that's actually assisting me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> there are many, there are many proof assistants which are uh, very much in the way of getting like, <laughs> yeah, you know. Uh, but I Isabel's, it, it's it's delightful to work in, uh, you know. But without dependent types, you, you do run into some walls. But um, man, that automation—it's so good. Dude. It, it does a lot of my job for me. 
I don't know if you remember this because the last episode we, we did was number four. This is number 14, so 10 episodes in. Oh, I think wow. it, it's been a year. But in that episode, I was extremely excited talking about Isabel and telling yeah, you I know. all about this. I'm not sure I if know. you remember the details, but that that was pretty much was what I was saying. Like, it's so cool, Isabel, because it yeah. really helps you. There's so much automation. I was like, sledgehammer, sledgehammer, right? Oh, How do absolutely. you feel about that now? Yeah, I, I can, as, as someone who uses Isabel almost daily now, uh, I can say, yes, it definitely helps to make life easier. I also am very happy uh, that um, one of my other programs I'm on, we're using Cock and installed Cock Hammer, which is, you know, supposed to be oh, a, yeah. sort of, you know, roughly an approximation of what Isabel's hammer has. And now I'm happy to hear that it's coming on the new Cock platform, too. So hopefully these tools become more accessible and the improvers with dependent types. So what are you approving there? Uh, the the one that's for the cock program is under the vSpells, uh, um, DARPA vSpells program. And so we're sort of trying to reason about legacy uh, code bases by composing different types of DSLs. Most of them are DSLs related to like, I don't know, uh, like packet filters or stuff like this. <laughs> How does this translation though? Because I assume they not like, they have a code base and like, how do you, it's like by hand, you look at the data types and then you encode it's, them. It's in a, well. Yeah. I, I don't know how many details I can get into it, but it like get into, but it, it's a complicated pipeline. I'll, I'll say that. Um, uh, there, there's, there's some element of like human in the loop. There's not a lot of, uh, I mean, it's, 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 it's equal parts automation and then human in the loop. Yeah. Um, it's not a fully push button solution that we're working towards <laughs> right no yeah of course definitely i'm really curious like uh so i have somehow never gotten into isabella hall so how do you prove things without dependent types so it's it's kind of funny and so this, this actually came up recently on twitter too talia ringer made a joke uh, well, it's like, why is it called, or who call it Agda, not typed hall? Because it's supposed to be referring to like programming with type holes or something like this. And it actually sparks some interesting conversation with folks. Uh, some, I mean, some of it just goes over my head, but it was like wondering about, you know, what, what kind of, like when you use dependent types for like a higher order logic and like, when do you need more than one universe or something versus not? Um, and how much can you get away with? Um, and I will say that, uh, at least from my personal experience, there is a fair amount of things you can get away with without dependent types. Uh, it, I mean, it's it, generally, I think it's easier to express them in dependent types, but um, yeah, Hall, think... it, Hall itself is giving me a different perspective. Like there's, there's more room between the more room in there than I thought. I think the, the most important thing to get clear is that in order to prove things, you just need a logic, right? And that's the key that you have in dependent types is because you're you're bridging the gap between the logic and the programming language bits, right? So the main idea of Isabel, or should I say Hall as a whole, so so high Hall is it stands for higher order logic, right? So the key thing they 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 went doing there is going this other way around on the sense of they already have the logic, and the question there is how do I build a programming language on top of that? Right, so you already have this whole system to to reason about. You just have the way to talk about programming languages. Um, and and the, and the key thing to, to when when we're talking about dependent types, I think, is kind of like your types can depend on terms, right? And turns out you can get away a lot proving things without that particular, that in particular. So, for example, that I think the most important project that there is in, in Isabel Hall is the CEL4, right? So they could, they could actually come up with the proof of correctness of a whole OS there called CEL4. Yeah. And that's, that's really amazing. And that thing runs on drones, and the drones are pretty much un, unhackable. It's been on many, on some competitions. And there is some some stuff going on, on on magazines, you know, like they talk of how this stuff is actually unhackable, and they couldn't get much information out of this. Which I'll is say really we cool. 
we used part of we use their uh, in part of that development there's this tool called autocores which you can use to lift the subset of c programs directly into isabel so it'll take a c program and re represent it as like this stateful monad uh, and like give you a purely functional representation of it and you can reason over it with hor logic um, but on a lot of that um, like uh, that framework was like I don't, that, that framework itself is incredibly usable, but or incredibly useful. But they also have something um, going back to dependent type, which was which where my sort of train mm. of thought was going. Uh, they have a word library which is sort of dependently typed in a way in which you can have like natural numbers index your word size. So it's sort of it's not like you know actual dependent types, but it's just like you know like in refinement types level kind of dependent types like decidable um, subset. Yeah, 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 and that's like it goes again to like show like sometimes you don't need the full thing, but uh, like like small small types indexing are are are, are pretty nice <laughs> in in practice. So Eric, I have a question for you actually. I think out of the three of us, you're the only one who actually went to Popo this year, which ah. is fully remote, right? How how did yeah. that go? Well, I, I, I do wish I could have gone in, in person. It, it actually is my my first popple ever. Um, oh, really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I, I was supposed to go visit and uh, stay with my brother in Philly. Unfortunately, they got COVID, but uh, oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. But they, they're doing fine. Um, I, I, I learned a lot from it. Um, uh, I think one of the more interesting bits was the the saturday wits workshop on oh, implementing type systems i wish i could go to that one okay yeah yeah that was that was really interesting to see uh mostly because um there were a lot of people who are actively developing these type systems in small like chat rooms that were like right. you know, 10 of us like talking just... about yeah, Jasper like, Cox was organizing, right? So I think I think yes. maybe Aaron was there. I think um, who yep. else? Matheus Zo, the people. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. And then there was, um, yes, yeah. There, there was there was a lot of these things. And I learned how like Agda implements like records and stuff like that, or like folds their modules down to like I don't know definitions that are just prefixed with uh, the name. <laughs> mm, yeah, makes sense. I wonder. Yeah. I wonder how different in cock would be. That would be a very interesting discussion. Well, it seemed like the 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 discussion was we need better theory for modules or something. I don't know. Ah. It was it, it, <laughs> like the Agda solution was unsatisfactory to okay. the okay. Yeah. Who else was there? Uh, I and I'm mixing. I'm mixing the virtual workshop a week later with the wits partially. Um, uh. Oh, there was a uh, uh, John Sterling gave. It was there. Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah. He had the keynote, and it was um, something like build three to throw away. It's like implementations of cubicle cubicle type theory, mm -hmm. and it was sort of going through his progression of um, like started with like type checkers from I don't know uh, Mortberg and those folks in like 2016 to like Red TT to Cool TT or stuff like that. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, and sort of like. He, he he's the end of that was a call to action to say hey there's a lot of you know people in the theorem community, proving community and we should focus on sharing our solutions to making these things more usable i think was one of his key points wow. from that presentation which is really that makes a lot of sense and i definitely agree so for the listener who is not aware so john sterling is a bob harper student that just finished i don't i'm not sure if i can say just finished his phd because covid is just been just dragging anyways he went to europe now and the key the key idea that i see a lot from bob harper's students or should i say bob constable students because bob harper is a student of bob constable and bob constable is the father of new pearl and then after new pearl came um so yeah bob harper worked a lot of new pearl and then John Sterling started working on Nupro, but then ended up kind of branching the Nupro family into Red Pro and now Cool TT, right? What else? Yeah, I, I, some... well, yeah. He, he said uh, that with Red or with Red Pearl, he was convinced that Red Pearl is the right way with its extrinsic typing, and then he's like, nope. In his his more recent ones, he's 
sort of like quote gone back to orthodoxy (laughs) 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 yeah (laughs) oh man i want to interview him sometime so what else any any other interesting bits on popo oh there was one frank fenning gave an interesting talk on this thing called adjoint logic which i had not heard before but it's, it's it's sort of like a framework for being able to stack different logics on top of each other. And and what I mean by that is like you have um, different like layers of syntax where you have like, I have these connectives at this layer, these connectives at this layer, and these connectives at this layer. And you can like pull uh, expressions from one layer of syntax up into higher ones. Um, and something about, uh, layers on top can't depend on layers on bottom. Anywho, all of that to say, um, it, it's a really general framework and it's it was it abstracted over a lot of things of like having a, like ghost code or like, um, what was the example? I don't know the examples off the top of my head, but, uh, hold on. By ghost second. code, do you mean like things like phantom types or? Yeah, or maybe not necessarily fandom types. I'm trying to find... I just sent some example to someone real quick. Oh, wait. Okay. Yeah, ghost and monadic programming with Fest. So I'm, I'm reading from one of his slides now. It says that this framework sort of generalizes uh, intentionality and runtime code generation, lax logic, ghosts and monadic programming with effects, some partial evaluation, mixed linear and nonlinear logics, modal types in programming languages. All, all these kinds of things apparently can be modeled in this. Um, so is it like... Which, a, I, I don't know. I had never really heard of it before. So I, 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 I haven't read it yet, but it's definitely in my queue. So is it is it a general logic which expresses all of these? Or is it more of a like a framework of abstraction so that you can stack them on top of each other, like you said? I assume you mean an abstraction I, stack. It's, I think... I. Yeah, I, yeah I, I think it's, I mean, I think it's, it's a way there, it's a logic where your syntax lets you lift, like you have different layers of syntax and you can lift up and down between them or something like this. And so you can use that to represent these things. So I guess like in something like intentionality and run kind code generation, maybe like some one thing lives at one level, one thing lives at the other and you're able to like reason. Uh, so as one of TARC's current students, the first thing that comes to mind when you say this is lightweight module, um, modular staging in hmm. Scala. What is that? Uh, the idea is abstraction with no regret. Uh, essentially, they provide, well, very similarly, a way to stack a tower of interpreters on top of each other and uh, collapse them down. It's lightweight because you can just use Scala syntax at every level of abstraction, and uh, it like it, it's based on the same concept as the Futamura projections. I don't know if you're familiar. Uh, nope. No. So that's actually a really cool concept. So essentially, it's partial evaluation. The idea is that if you have an interpreter and you have a program, and uh, you put these two together and you perform partial uh, evaluation on it. Well, the partial evaluator combined with the interpreter is essentially a compiler. Hmm. And they take that one step further and they say that if you have a compiler and a program and you like you combine the compiler and the partial interpreter, you get a compiler generator. And like so yeah, exactly. So LMS is essentially based on this framework where you can like design things at a very high level, talk about how it maps downwards. And in that way, you uh, you get a, a very nice stack which collapses down, partial evaluation. So abstraction without regret. And like... Uh, gotcha. <laughs> is, is that your paper reference for the audience and also for me to hoard? Uh, no, actually. <laughs> so I actually don't work okay. on LMS myself. It's just something oh, that okay. comes up in the group a lot. That's more... Uh, the people who work on LMS are more on the system side of things. I'm more on the like formal type theory and like meta theoretic properties ah, gotcha. of dependent object type side of things. Gotcha. Mm-hmm. Dependent so dependent object types is deal, dots, yep. right? And I think last time I checked, uh, what, what's his name? Oliver. 
Yes, Oliver. Oliver, he was he was working on it, right? And do you have any updates on on what what they're up to over there? Uh so with dots. About a year ago, the thrust was going towards integrating full dependent types in dependent object types. So currently, yes. dependent object types has a very peculiar form of dependent types called path dependent types. So uh, I think it's probably better to explain in terms of Scala. So uh, in, in a typical object-oriented language, you have like fields and methods. What if you also add types to, uh, to your objects? So a class can have a particular type, like a type mm -hmm. as a member, to be precise. And in the, right. class, oh, in the sure. classic object-oriented sense, if you create two objects, uh, their types need not be the same. Like the, the path dependent type okay. that they contain, mm -hmm. their type member. So uh, gotcha. take this one level further and uh, let's assume that you are allowed to keep that type abstract. So uh, currently in path dependent types exist in other languages as well. And there are usually two different... Really? Yes. Like uh, in the... Huh. I, think in, I think they exist in OCaml. They do exist in... So mm -hmm. there, there are two typical flavors of path dependent types. Like one is... Uh, transparent types where you have to instantiate the type from the get-go and then you and at that point it's not really that interesting it's basically like a type synonym uh, there are opaque types where you have the type like kind of specified internally but outside you have no type information uh, but what 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 happens in Scala's type system is something in between they call it translucent path dependent types because Scala has subtyping so uh, the idea is you can specify the bounds on this abstract type, and therefore you get information about the bounds outside, but you may not necessarily get information about what type it may be instantiated to, if at all you instantiate it. So that is the form of path of dependent types that like dependent object types has. And this is a really strange form of dependent object types relative to other dependently typed language, which is why like for the last, uh, well, for the last few years, one of the things that I've been working on was actually trying to like inter trying trying to translate dependent like things in dependent object types to the calculus of construction, so that we can kind of study those in a better understood mm -hmm. calculus. So our goal was to like yeah. create a translation which has uh, which preserves well typeness and number of reductions, and just see what we where, where that leads from there. And uh, yeah, it's so but. The thrust of the work that Oliver was doing about a year ago, although uh, this is me paraphrasing his work, so I may get a few things wrong, but like essentially the idea was sometimes dependent types can actually simplify the meta theory of a language. Currently, the meta theory of dot is really well; it's complicated. It's it's a it's a, it's a pretty large system designed for uh, designed to represent Scala, which is aims to be object oriented and functional and like dependent types and everything so the best of all the yes. world and yeah. like <laughs> if you if you look at like the the papers trying to prove properties about scala's type system you'll find that like there was about a decade of work before they actually arrived at the current iteration which is dependent object types because it was just that hard to pin down and even within dependent object types classic proof methods that you would use to like prove properties of your language just somehow didn't like apply they didn't work out as well and therefore developing the meta theory has always been a challenge so the idea was if we add full dependent types can we actually simplify the meta theory instead of complicating it so mm. uh i don't think we got super far with that yet uh because the work on the translation also hit a few dead ends along the way but it's it's certainly an interesting direction and like i i very much enjoy the idea of like a language with dependent types and subtyping and see. Yeah. I, I'd really like mm -hmm. to really like to see that. I, I, I don't know if uh, Pedro knows the last time I was on the podcast, I was actually working for a functional programming consultant uh, consultancy working on Scala. I, I I'd actually never uh, haven't really seen dependent like path types or stuff in the wild. Um, but I would love to see uh what that sort of looks like in like, I don't know, industry developments or something like that. Right. You actually might have seen dependent, like path dependent types in the wild because uh, I believe that, so I'm sure you're familiar with generic type parameters. So, yes. so yeah. adding those type parameters is kind of isomorphic to adding the type member within the object itself. 
Oh, okay. Okay. So you would have seen it in that context. Gotcha. And they also allow you to gotcha. specify subtyping bounds on that as well. Oh, yep. I, see. I see. Things got so much clearer, clearer now. It's basically <laughs> like... Yes, it's basically you're providing inside the object what is the like an abstract type that the object is going to work on, and then when you are instantiating the type, then you have to say, okay, inside this object is going to 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 be talking about this particular type, right? And I, I see now how this how this is actually somehow kind of implemented in OCaml as well because you're doing the same inside a, an OCaml module, you can also talk about this abstract abstract type in there. Mm -hmm. In fact, uh, OCaml also has translucent path-dependent types because they, they do have module that. subtyping and such. I'm glad I'm glad yeah. I now have a term to put with this now. There's something to like, yeah, to understand. This is kind of like a nice segue from saying, oh, you know, there's plenty of room between just regular hall and independent type and like different flavors of dependent mm -hmm. types. <laughs> this also reminds me, now that we're talking about modules in OCaml, I've been, I took some time to finally understand what parametricity is about. Uh, what's the other name for parametricity? There's another name. Theorems for free. Well, that's the pa that's the yeah. Wadler's paper and that got it m even more famous, but Reynolds came out, came out with the actual, was the first one who came out with it. He was using it to prove normalization for system F. I think it was normalization. Strong normalization, yes. And the way that he he they have to somehow kind of come up with an with a newer proof technique, although by the papers that I was reading, it seems like it was kind of around in, in other in other ideas, but he was the first one to bring these ideas down to programming languages. And by he I mean Reynolds, in order to show normalization of system F, he had to use um it's logical relations. So Reynolds had to bring the use of logical relations in order to be able to prove normalization. And was it the Gerard Tate method? I'm sorry? Was Gerard the word Tate. that you were missing the Gerard Tate method? Or was it something else entirely? I don't know what, what Gerard yeah, yeah, method I, I, is. Yeah. Okay. I feel okay. that's something no, I should right. know. <laughs> do, do you do you have a a clean, like an easy way to explain uh, what that is? Well, essentially, it's a method used to prove strong normalization. Uh, I, I'm not super comfortable talking about yeah, the details yeah, yeah. because, as I've mentioned, dependent object types don't abide by traditional proof methods. Right. So I haven't actually used it in like myself. Well, so, okay. So now coming to theorem for free. So Reynolds used this idea of, of they, they didn't call it parametricity back yet, but he used this idea of logical relations in order to Proof normalization. And then the, I want to say the genius of, of Philip Wadler, because I don't know, somehow Philip Wadler just can look at stuff that is already done and connect to other stuff and come up with something very unique and present it in a very clean way in a paper. I, I really, I really enjoy Philip Wadler's work. I think it, he's really cool. But in a sense, he didn't come up with anything new in a sense. He just like, hey guys, there is this ideas that we are using for proving normalization over here that Reynolds showed, I want to show that we can do even more with the exact same technique because once we have this logical relation, we can show that we, we have some theorems that are free. We have some theorems that we didn't ha have to prove that this theorem holds. We have some theorem that lives kind of outside of this scope here. And that's, that's theorem for free. That's where he actually coins the term parametricity. And the main idea of what parametricity means is that just by looking at the type of our function, we can assert some facts of how the function should look like and should behave. So we, we can assert some properties without even knowing what this function is. And that's what free means, right? And the, the main example that it's... it's it's used all over the place is the, the identity function. So what's about identity function? Identity, of identity function in system F is pretty much just for all A, H way, right? Like you give me a type A, you give me an element of this type A, and I'm going to return this type A. Why am I going to return this guy of type A? Because 
what else can I do without actually looking at the type? What else can I do without looking at this type other than returning Throw an the exception. Type? <laughs> <laughs> and then then you just broke parametricity that's exactly yeah. what parametricity means so parametricity comes from the name of like just looking at the parameters we can we can know stuff right so if we're looking if we're looking at a, at a function that is well behaved just by looking at the type we can we can come up with with some behavior of it so for this particular type for all a h way i know that this must be the identity function Exactly because there is nothing else I can do with, with, with this, with an element that is abstract like that, right? But there are some languages that break parametricity. Why? Because you can actually know, like the function can actually inspect what it is doing. So for example, Java, you have the instance of, right? Operator. So in Java, this parametricity relation doesn't hold because if you have this generic function that you're giving this type A, and an element of this type A, you can actually inspect like, okay, so if this function is a bool, you can return 35. If this one, so like you can, you can do other stuff. You can, you can go crazy. You don't have to return what you just gave because now you have operations depending on what type it is, you know, like, so you can, you can do other stuff there. And so, like, I want to plug in another scale effect here. Like, uh, on this note, I, I, I really appreciate what Scala's done with their pattern matching because their pattern matching is essentially you take a superclass and you the pattern match itself can basically be desugared to a bunch of is instance of for all the subclasses. Right. And I, I always oh, thought that was really nice. I actually believe that's yeah. what Java is retroactively trying to build its pattern matching by taking yeah. that. And yeah, <laughs> it's kind of a nasty <laughs> process watching them patch it just to get a Scala Kotlin result. <laughs> well but in a sense that's kind of all that pattern matching is doing anyways right it's just still kind of like a tree of there there is a name for this tree i think it's called case split even even okay so now i'm, I'm getting in a little bit of extra implementation of what's going on under under pattern matching because i have to think about this so anyways just just to give you guys some some idea of what what I'm doing right now in my research. Well, I think I think last time maybe maybe we talked about this. So I worked I was working on Cockable Camel and I was translating some idea of JDTs, you know, like translating JDTs of old camel to cock. And then there's some theory mismatch of what's actually going on over there. And I have to, I actually had to be a little bit more smart of how I'm gonna handle this translation. And I came up with some uh, how can I put it? It's 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 not it's not any anything smart. It's just something that hasn't been around much. Uh, I gave it an, uh, a cute name. I gave it a name of Swaddle, and we tried to publish these results of how to actually embed this idea. So th th the main idea is that instead of instead of translating the type system of the JDTs directly to types in Coq, I embedded this type system in an inductive data type. That's that's all that's happening here. And once I even talked to some other other implementers and they said, yeah, this is really staple on how to actually, you know, like talk about types in, in index data types, because you don't want to work in types directly in Coq. You want to, um, so when you have an index of a data type, you don't want to work with types directly because that's going to make things kind of break and not work well. Anyways, why am I saying all of this? Because my paper was rejected from CPP. Yay. First rejection. And now... Ooh. We have to resubmit and then, well, the reviewers, to be completely honest, they complain that I don't have a, a meta theory, like I don't have any any reasoning of why my my stuff should work, right? So I'm developing this this meta theory and it's so much more complicated than it looks like. Like I'm coming with with a type system for a mini O camel, for example, and a type system for a mini CIC. And it's it's very fun. I really feel like I'm doing some actual PhD work now. Let's <laughs> 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 see that's that's how it goes. So, anyways, uh, with that out of the way, I've been I've been reading some some papers about pattern matching in order for me to implement the type system properly. And how is actually how pattern matching is actually implemented under the hood is with this thing called case split. 
So K split is basically a tree of the patterns that you were applying in your in your pattern matching. So basically what the algorithm the type checker is doing in order to check that your pattern matching is exhaustive, which is definitely the case for OCaml, is and probably is is Scala pattern matching must be exhaustive or does it is it like Haskell that you, you can, can leave some stuff behind? Warning for it. I don't know if I it complains. Expect that you can set a warning. Yeah. Well, in OCaml, yeah. your your code is not gonna gonna compile. It's not a warn. It's an error. It, it's been a year since I've since I was, only a year since I was just doing Scala, and I can't remember. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, same here. <laughs> so what this case splits does is basically it builds it in, in, in inside inside of well. When you're implementing the type checker, it builds this tree of actually going through all of the instantiations that that your pattern matching can go through that is going to be well typed. And it turns out that this is actually really cool now because when you have in the presence of JDTs, the type checking of pattern matching is undecidable because you can you can actually encode a tree machine in the pattern matching, and therefore you cannot. Ouch. You cannot actually go down and, and better match every well, you cannot type type you cannot type check everything that you can actually express, otherwise you solve the Turing the Turing halting problem, right? <laughs> so I thought, I thought that, that was really interesting. That was really interesting. Anyways, that's it for what I'm doing. I I I went through this tangent just to talk about the case split, which is building this tree of all the possible of the possibles constructors that your pattern match can actually go through in order for it to be exhausted. And as as you as you can see there there are some of the pattern of the matches that can happen that you can look into it that is not actually in a case split but then things can go weird and maybe your pattern match is even correct but your type checking doesn't can't even know that it's correct because otherwise halting problem. And that's really interesting. I have Anyways. a qu yeah, question. And I, I, I was wondering, so if I have a function in cock from type to type or set to set, yeah. is it possible in any way to pattern match no. on the universe? Mm -hmm. And that's without... exactly and that's exactly why I said that you don't want to index your data types with something of just type because you yeah. cannot pattern match over it. And yep. therefore, it really limits what you can do with that with that with that type. And the reason why you cannot pattern match then is that you pattern match inductive data types. What is inductive data types? Is something built out of constructors. And what is type? Can be yeah. anything, right? Yeah. I think it's for this exact use case that like Agda uses induction recursion and such. Like they define type codes for each of the types, and the recursion step can actually map those type codes to types within Agda itself. Mm. That's what I was about to say. I mean, if you do mechanism. some kind of quoting, you can kind of sort of do it, but it's yes. not. It's not. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's similar. It's similar, but induction recursion now is is a next level of inductive data types. I would say. There are some stuff that it, I don't have a proof for this, and I haven't seen a proof for this. But I'm convinced that inductive induction recursion is more expressive than inductive inductive definitions. I don't. Again, I don't have a proof for this. I'm not sure, but I feel so. <laughs> <laughs> um, like any any intuition in this direction? Like <sighs> the intuition is that well. Things things got pretty complicated now because there there are some some properties that you can that that you that your inductive definition must hold. So for example, in Conk, it must be the case that all your constructors, all your all the indexes of your constructors are strongly positive, right? Otherwise, otherwise you can in, you can have inconsistency. You will have inconsistencies really quick and. You can you can check the you can check Cockart. There there's a there's a little piece of chapter that he shows really really easily how you can encode that if you allow 
data types to not be strongly positive occurrence. I think it's strictly positive. Strict. Oh, oh, yeah, strictly. strictly. Thank yeah, you. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Anyways, so there are some properties that it, your, your language must hold. And then, actually, when I was trying to come up with this solution on, on how to properly embed the type system of OCaml for, you know, talking about, about JDTs, there is a nice trick that you can do in, in Coq for you to not necessarily talk about the indexes. So there is this Stack Overflow question where instead of building a JDT with with the indexes of the family in Coq, you are you, you build an existential an, ex, uh, an element of an existential type, because then instead of leaving leaving the the types the the type indexes inside of your inductive definition, you take the index out, so you come up with your language and everything, and then later after the fact, you go ahead and you talk about how how each one of the constructors must behave just like as you're doing your, your JDT things, right? So you're saying, okay, so for the first constr constructor, your index is going to be of this shape. And for the second constructor, your, index is, your indexes are going to be of this shape. And then later on, you, bound, you bundle all of this into an existential type, right? But here's where things start getting hairy of why why I believe that induction, induction, inductive recursive definitions are more expressive is because inductive inductive definition, what it means is that you can have an inductive definition depending on the next inductive definition. So that's the width, the width mm -hmm. keyword in Coq, I believe. So you define yeah. the first yeah. the or end even. Anyway, so like you define the first, so the, the, the most known one is even odd, right? Like in order for you to define even, you need the definition of odd and the definition of odd depends on the definition of even. So it's true inductive definitions that depend on each other. That's what inductive inductive definitions mean. But then now you, we come back to this, to, this, to this translation that I was talking about where I'm trying to translate Gadgets and, and gadgets is, is a sort of inductive inductive definitions, right? But now in order for me to properly embed this in this idea of, of existentials that I was I was explaining, I think it would be better explained if, if we had some pen and paper. It would be very clean to, to show that. But just keep in mind that um, I have two definitions, right? I have a, an inductive definition and I have a recursive definition. And I bundle all of that together with an existential, with an element of an existential type, right? So now when I'm translating inductive inductive definition, so let's say even odd in, in OCaml, now I need I need an induction inductive inductive definition that depends on the recursive on the recursive thing, and then so like the 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 recursive function depends on inductive thing, and the inductive thing depends on induction on the recursion as well. So I cannot actually use the same the same translation to translate the inductive inductive definitions if I want to you know like Peel out the, the 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 recursive part of the indexes, right? Because I'm talking about the indexes in a recursive definition, not an inductive definition. So in order for you to close this gap, I need the recurs the recursive definition, and therefore I need inductive recursive definition, and therefore that was not a suitable translation for me, which was very very upsetting <laughs> because things would be so much cleaner. Anyways. That's the end of my rant. <laughs> Talk does not have inductive <laughs> recursive definitions, and that's uh, that's my rant. I how do you? Um, I, I was wondering if you've talked about this with Ben before, but like, how do you represent something like inductive recursive or inductive inductive? Like, can you can you represent those with like W types where you take like the least fixed point of something? I have no idea, bro. As I mean, no, like I the, yeah, the way you Wait, build. Hang like, on, but hang on. Let's take a step back. What do you mean by represent? Yeah. Well, I mean, like, so, you know, recursive data types as pol like fixed points of polynomials, like what happens right. in data types a la carte or meta theory a la carte. So basically, you're, you're kind of embedding the data types as plain types. So it's, it's kind of like what we do in Sedil, right? So instead of yeah. having the data type as part of your theory, you're yep. doing a church encoding or some magic encoding. They use Mendler and blah, blah, blah. 
amazing codings in order to actually talk about these data types, right? Yeah. Okay. So yeah. go on. Yeah. I was, I was just wondering, is there a, like a, a generalization of that to inductive, inductive or something like this, or you kind of, kind of like depend on each other or what that would look like? I, That's I don't a really know. Good question. Actually. Good question. Yeah. Let's, let's ask Aaron to do an episode about that yeah. on his podcast. Yeah, <laughs> Well, okay, so I think, did I say everything I had to say about parametricity? I think there was one last thing, which is the proofs that relating parametricity. So when, when you actually come down and use the, the logical relations to do your proofs, they're so hairy. They're so hairy. It took me weeks to do like, it would take me a week to do like one case of of something I was working on. Maybe, maybe I'm just dumb. I, I, I am dumb. That's, that's the takeaway. <laughs> it, it's really hard. But the cool thing, there, there is another cool, thing, cool application of logical relations. So another cool application is that now we can talk about, about relatedness of programs. And that's really fun because, again, uh, going back to, to the module system that we were talking about, right? So we were talking about dot and all of that. How do we know that two modules or that two mod mod modules are the same, are kind of like implements the same idea, right? So uh, put it another way, let's say I have a module that works with with any 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 sort of of containers, right? So like list. I have a, mo a module that have a bunch of op operations over 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 a container, right? I don't know what the container actually is. So it can be a list, it can be a vector, it can be an array, it can be just a bag, you know, a set, right? How do I know that any, all, all of this, all, all of them are gonna behave the same? Again, is, is this idea of parametricity, right? And, and how do you prove that? Is by showing that if you plug in a list and you plug in an array, the results, like the observable, the observable result is, is always is never going to change, right? So, turns out that if you're smart enough on how you come up with your logical relation and how things things relate to each other, it's exactly the same definition as contextual equivalence, which is exactly what I just what I just said, and that's really cool. So that's pretty fascinating. I'm, Contextual equivalence, you said, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm actually. I'm, well, I was when you were saying that. I was actually thinking about structured identity principle from Hot, which is sort of like where you can say if I have two different implementations of a queue, and they have, if you show that the they're equivalent on their outputs of like right. their you know methods, then they're the yeah. same queue. And I'm I'm wondering what kind of relation. So like structured structured identity principle and contextual equivalence have because I I mean I've I've heard you recently talking about contextual equivalence I haven't really dug into that though. Well, so conte contextual equivalence is literally coming up with a syntax to to, to talk about all the all the holes that can happen in your program, right? Hmm. So it's basically this idea. It's it's in a sense is this idea of like okay I have I have a function and it has a body and then I. Like this context is pretty much kind of like the function and I can plug in this body inside the function, right? So the context is saying pretty much like, okay, you have a program with a hole, with a hole where I can put anything, even it doesn't even have to type check, but then there, there, there is some typing rules where you can make sure that the, the whatever you plug in, into the, the hole is going to be type safe, right? It's going to be, mm. it's, it's going to still have the, the right type. And the basic idea of, of contextual equivalence is exactly to talk about the equivalence of programs, right? However, when you're doing when you actually sit down to do the to actually prove things with with context, with these contexts, things get very hairy because then you, you go through every single possible way you can construct this whole, right? So yeah, those are many cases and it's very synthetic and Sometimes it's kind of untrackable. So when you when you actually do them in logical relations, things go like that real quick and easy in a way. And turns out that they are actually talking about the same thing. The, the main difference of the logical relation is instead of being an inductive definition 
over the structure of your terms. This is an yeah. inductive definition over the structure of your type. And they're, and they're a lot more constrained over there. Like they're a lot, they're, the way you construct your types are, are usually much less than the way you construct your terms, right? Anyways, enough of parametricity. Let's move on. <laughs> it's getting boring. Uh, just one quick question. One last question before we move on. So I'm not super familiar with this notion of contextual equivalence. So I'm curious. So a couple of few months ago, I was thinking about how to develop the meta theory for parametricity within dependent object types. And given that dependent object types basically has examples very similar to what you were talking about, where you have like collections and subtypes of collections, would you say that contextual equivalence is a good place to start if I want to like proceed in that direction? Uh, yeah. Let me think a little bit. So you don't even need to define contextual equivalence in a sense. You can just go ahead and talk about, about logical relations all the way, like directly. Then in order for you to show that your, your logical relation is doing the same as a contextual as contextual equivalence, then yeah, you have to show that they reduce to each other. Take a look at PF, PFBL, Bob Harper's blue book. There is a chapter on parametricity with that. And if you really want to understand all this stuff that I was talking about, take a look on I want to say the name of the of the notes is from Amala Mad, but the yes. first author is not Amala Mad. Let uh, me yeah. actually get his name. I think that was probably a student who attended that. The, there's OPLS as lectures uh, of Amala Mad teaching yes. logical relations. Oh, so so actually, this is the note the student took. I, I think so. I think because oh. I, I I think I remember watching some OPLS in this video. Dude, and like students take notes. <laughs> This guy is the is a beast note taking then <laughs> because it's such a complete set of notes. So here here yeah. it is: an introduction to logical relation, proving programs properties using logical relations. His name is Lau Korstengard, if I didn't butcher it too much. Mm -hmm. And yeah, all of this all this stuff we're talking about is gonna be in the links of the, in the description of the podcast, so our listener can go ahead and and check that out. So what I was saying, Nitin, is if you want to understand more about all this stuff that I was talking about, I would suggest you actually work through the proofs of this paper. It took me a couple of weeks actually to to actually go through everything I wanted to go. I stopped on the universal types, well, on the existential types. Sorry. Because universal types is exactly when you actually get to system F and where you actually get the parametricity theorem by itself. Because before that is talking about logical relations, but in an easier setting, like it's building up the, the intuition in an easier way. Anywho, check out that paper and those proofs. It's Benjamin Pierce says that these are... Is it Benjamin Pierce or Bob Harper? I'm I'm inclined to say it's Benjamin Pierce on his red book. Said says that these are the most beautiful proofs in programming languages <laughs> are parametricity stuff because and using logical relations because it is it is amazing. This is amazing stuff working happening under the hood here. Okay. Thanks for the references. Yes. So that out of my system, because I spent a lot of time understanding all of that stuff. I hope I didn't get you guys too confused and it was some, somewhat entertaining to listen to. Well, that's it for this episode. I hope you guys enjoyed as much as we did recording it. I apologize for taking so long in between these episodes. I just got COVID like everyone else this beginning of year. So I was kind of useless and also beginning of semester. You guys know how it is. But my goal is to release one new episode every month at least. Hopefully I'll be able to get a little more. But make sure to follow us on your favorite podcast provider. Leave us a rating if 
the provider supports like Spotify or Apple. Does Apple support it? I'm not sure. If it supports, please leave us a rating so that we can grow and share it with a friend. Also follow us on Twitter at tt for all so that you always know when a new episode comes out and i'll see you guys next time